It's another episode of No Driving Gloves. We've got the three of us tonight. We're a little undecided and a little uh, wandering tonight. Uh, Derek's back from his travels. Will's bought a brand new estate. John really hasn't done a damn thing. Estate? Come on. Well, not a whole state. Yeah, it's just merely a, a mansion. <laughs> a mansion. Just takes up a yep. county, not an entire state. Y'all have lost your mind, y'all's minds. Well, we were talking about cost overruns last week. Now we know where the money goes. But mm-hmm. If I remember right, though, Derek, you were at the uh, National Association of Automotive Museum Conference, someplace that I should have been, but for some reason we didn't make it. Uh, maybe I'll go ahead. I believe you felt you were too good for it or something. I, I knew I was too good for it. There's confidence in everything. Yeah. Or I just didn't have time. Damn race coming up. But I do want to ask, did you get a C? And I know there's a lot of controversy between AACA Club and AACA Museum and AAC Library, et cetera, et cetera. But I read an article, might have been today, could have been yesterday, on the new, or the recently debuted AACA a bookmobile that has like a seven-year restoration project on it. Speaking of going over in time and that, did you see that or find out anything on it? Or You know, I didn't. Um, I, I guess I heard a little blurb about it, maybe the same thing you saw. Um, I, I guess it didn't even cross my mind while I was there, though. So, no, I honestly, I did not see it nor hear about the project. I just thought it was an interesting thing. If anybody hasn't seen it, uh, Hemmings has a little thing on it, uh, either on May or April 16th or 17th. They talked about it, and it was a uh, 1955 bookmobile, and it's basically a chassis cab 3800, I think, Chevrolet with a custom box on the back for a bookmobile. But by 58, they said that bookmobiles, as we kind of know them, you know, the converted buses, had become the norm, so it was basically, when it was built, it was obsolete and didn't serve too long, and then it was put up by whatever library actually had it commissioned and stored until about 10 years ago when the building it was stored in was sold and the guy that owned it convinced whatever library, the guy that bought the building convinced whatever library that owned it that he was going to properly restore the car, and then the AACA library get heard about it and went ahead and did a restoration. Oh, now you don't need to read the article. That's just kind of how it is. You can see the pictures. But I just thought that was something that maybe you had noticed up there at, uh, while you were in the Hershey, Pennsylvania area enjoying the museum and the wonderful stimulating lectures that come with every conference. Hey, will you put a link to that up on our social media? Yeah, I can do that. I'd like to read that. Anything else going trying on? Trying to have a... Trying to have a what? Well, we were trying to have a conversation here, but, you know, Will just butts in. No. That's right. That's what I do. We all have our roles in this, Derek. Jeez. You complain, <laughs> I moderate, and Will butts in. That's right. Now That's I know where my dog... the magic of this podcast. <laughs> Now I know where my daughters get it from. <laughs> uh. Well, I believe, John, you were just asking uh, kind of how or uh, what Will and I are up to and how things have been going. And uh, obviously, I just got back from, as you say, the, the NAM Conference Association of Automobile Museums, as well as I hit Another conference while I was out there, which was the HVA Historic Vehicle Association conference, and uh, but had a good trip. Uh, we actually made a tour day uh, for the NAM conference at the Smithsonian Institute, of course, down in Washington D.C., and had the opportunity to tour the Garber facility, which is their storage facility, and toured the warehouses that house the collections of the American History Museum. And so I got to see some of the interesting artifacts, vehicles, different machinery, uh, just kind of general large uh, three-dimensional artifacts 
that are housed there at their storage facility. So that was a interesting and, and cool experience to be involved in. And then uh, spoke at the HVA conference on actually something that'll probably relate to our topic tonight, I think. So I'm going to hold off on that. And Will, did you have anything uh, going on uh, that kind of pertains to the podcast or? <laughs> <laughs> Um, not really. I mean, um, just pretty normal, pretty, pretty normal week around here other than, you know, closing, selling my house and buying a house. Just okay. actually been, actually been working in the body shop a good bit here lately. Um, trying to help get one finished up. And, uh, I haven't, uh, I hadn't worked in the body shop in a while. So kind of, uh, doing some fresh things so that doesn't have anything to do with you having a new paint booth and uh wanting to uh experiment with it and <laughs> enjoy a little bit of your money because we know paint booths aren't exactly the least expensive shop tool um believe it or not uh we still have not painted anything in there uh we've baked a couple of things you know primer and stuff but um, I actually don't even have the airlines ran to it yet, so um, that's kind of <laughs> uh, still still waiting to paint something for the first time. Fifty thousand dollar paint booth, we Krylon in it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, if anybody's interested, I've uh, went ahead and put that AACA library article on our Facebook page, so. By the time you're hearing this, go back a week or so, and it should be on our Facebook page. Otherwise, I would forget. I'm a busy man. But as Derek alluded to, we've kind of decided on a topic this evening, and it, it's, it could be very controversial. It could be very moderate and very nice, because I think all of us have opinions on, and I'm not sure how we're going to narrow this down and keep it confined to an hour, but... Let's see what we can do. And the museum I'm at, we have a lot of these, and we use them to represent history as a um, very cost-conscious way of displaying artifacts without having to have the investment in the real artifact. A lot of times you want to portray a point in time or a period in time and things like that. We don't shy away from letting you know, but it really comes down to replicas and replicars and are they good or are they bad? And I don't think I want to get into kit cars and Bradley GTs and things like that, but I'm hoping to keep the topic discussing building four GT replicas or you know, then throwing it into the Corvette uh, arena. Um, the um, all of a sudden now I'm drawing a blank. The uh, blue Corvettes from '63. I want to say Banshees, Cheetahs, or the Cheetahs or the Grand Sports. Yeah, the Grand Grand Sports. That's what I'm going with. But we can go with any of them. And how? Or you know, we always can touch on the Cobras, or. You know, Lotus 7, which is, believe it or not, the most replicated car in the world. The Cobra is in the United States, but when you take in worldwide counts, the actual, actually the Lotus 7 is the most uh, replicated car in the world. And like I say, we'll shy away from kit cars, which Chapman and Lotus is kind of known for. Where do we want to go with this? Does anybody have feelings? Like I said, our museum actually displays them and uses them as a way of complementing errors in time. Instead of putting five, six million dollars into a Porsche 550, we have a really nice Beck replica. And that kind of shows you what the Lotus Mark 10s we have from 1955 would have been racing against at that period in time with it, you know, without having the five million dollars into a 550. Um, our benefactor obviously used to actually race 550s and 904s and RSKs and things. So, you know, he he's already had the real thing. That might be part of it. But it's like I said, it's a nice way of saying, well, here here's what Porsche had on the track, and then we have a Proteus D type, which is a replica of the Jaguar D type, and here's what Jaguar had on on the track, 
And here's what Lotus had on the track. And instead of having $20 million into this exhibit, we've got less than a half million dollars into the exhibit. And it allows us, of course, to then have other things and other artifacts to expand our collection. And that's just one way of looking at it. Um, I'll quit talking and let one of you two jump in and say your feelings, good or bad, happy or sad. Well, I think, you know, John, the museum world is a, a big place where this happens. And I think, and you can jump in and, and give me your thoughts on this as well. I think we need to maybe determine the definition of a, a recreation and a replica in, at least in my eyes and in my opinion, uh, a replica is a copy of a car that still exists, whereas a recreation is actually building a vehicle that exists and we're actually recreating it for the purpose of showing people what it was. And I, those two terms kind of get interchanged a little bit, and I, it always bothers me because it, it's nice to define each one as a certain, uh, you know, with a certain term. So in the case of this, I think most of what we would be talking about is really replicas, whereas there are a few recreations out there, uh, which I think are fantastic vehicles too. But I, hopefully you would agree with me on that terminology. I can kind of go with that terminology. It's so tossed about and take into example, again, the museum I'm at. We have the Beck 550, which is a replica. It's a kind of a replica of the uh, the 550, but, of course, it's fiberglass, not aluminum, et cetera, et cetera. But on the flip side, we own um, the Surtees 1964 Ferrari 158, the actual car Surtees ran most of his races in is historically documented. It's one of the oldest Ferrari Formula One cars in existence. And while this car was undergoing its restoration, uh, we discovered we had enough real parts left over, and with the patterns we had to make to finish the restoration of the real car, we were able to build a second car that we actually use a lot more than the real car, preserving history in the real car, but it also gave us the opportunity to paint the second car and it's an anomaly in 1964 instead of being a red ferrari formula one car it's a blue and white ferrari formula one car which is the way the car was campaigned in the last four races of 1964 and i think that's going to fall into what if i'm understanding how Derek's describing this this is actually a recre uh, recreation because we recreated a car that technically no longer exists where the 550 is well, I wouldn't call is, it is a replica of a car that exists. I, I would uh, no, I would still call the the Surtees car a, a replica because the car still exists of the car, but painted it in its you know the colors it was for the last four races. So the the actual car still exists. And that, that, I mean, that, in, that, in my eyes, I would call it just a replica. That, that, that's where the terminology, though, gets skewed because the NART colored car does not exist anymore, where the Ferrari colored car does. So, well, however, that's kind of splitting hairs. So, I guess we'll, there, there's our first yeah. argument on the topic. We'll let Will decide this. <laughs> it's. It is. It, it's a weird world, but uh, you know, replicas and recreations. In my opinion, and you know, clearly in in your opinion as well, John, in in the museum world, we have a great use for them. They are extremely important for preserving history and representing history at the same time. Uh, Henry Ford Museum, you know, the original quadricycle that Henry Ford built in 1896 still exists it's still maintained to where the engine will spin and everything will function the way it's supposed to, but that vehicle is never started. There is a replica of that car that runs and drives at different events, especially old car festival at, at Greenfield village, uh, along with the 1901 Ford sweepstakes, which was Henry Ford's first race car. 
you know, that car, they actually in 2000, well, in two, roughly 2000, they actually had that car in storage. You know, it's this car that kind of looks like sweepstakes, but they're not really sure what it is. And Ford Motor Company said, you know, we'd love to get that car out, at least understand what it is. Everybody kind of thought it was a, a, a recreation of sweep ta- sweepstakes that Ford had built later in life. Uh, pulled it out and started really investigating it and turned out, no, it was the real sweepstakes, chassis, engine, drivetrain, everything. The car had been in a barn that burnt at some point in its life. And the original body got severely damaged because, of course, it was wood. And Henry Ford had a new body built for it and put on it that was close to the original. So it was determined in 2000 that they would not operate that car. Rather, they tore it apart, made patterns off of every single piece of that car, and made two identical replicas of the sweepstakes so those could be driven during the 100th anniversary of Ford Racing. So close in replication, if I recall correctly, uh, the replicas weighed less than 100 pounds difference from the original car. And when running, they had all of the same issues that Henry Ford had documented in 1901 with the original sweepstakes. Same cylinder issues, same bearing issues, um, it was it was incredible how dead on of a replica it was, and as you say, John, those the the replica of sweepstakes and the replica of the quadricycle are extremely important to Henry Ford Museum because it allows them to operate those vehicles, allow people to see them uh, operating in motion, hear them, smell them, see what they were and really present that part of history without risking the original artifacts, uh, you know, the original vehicles uh, to any type of damage that might occur. Um, Rather, if something was to happen, you know, damage a replica, you can always go in and repair it and you're not, you know, you're just building on a replica that's already there. So in that case, you know, to me, they're, they're a very important, part of the automotive uh, landscape in that respect. So I don't know how Will feels about this being a hot rod guy. Well, I, you know, to be honest with you, I hadn't really ever thought about it in, in the museum industry like that. And it, it makes complete sense um, in, in that aspects of things. Uh, and I, in our industry, you know, we really don't have, I mean, we have, there's replicas, Everybody calls them kit cars, but they're really not. I mean, you can go buy a replica body of a 32 Ford, 33 Ford, just about any early Ford, Chrysler, whatever. Um, of course, made of fiberglass. And, you know, now, you know, Brookville's making them out of steel. Um, I'm just personally not a fan of fiberglass, you know, and, and unfortunately it makes me not like most, um, you know, aftermarket recreation bodies or replica bodies, however you want to word it, you know, in, in our industry, say you're going to build, you want to build a 32 Ford. Okay. Well, you go buy a body for, you know, $5,000 or 3,500 bucks, whatever they are. I don't, I don't keep up with it. So I don't the prices. Um, once you get the body, it costs the same to build that fiberglass car as it does if you'll just save for another, you know, six months, two years, however long it takes you to save money to go buy a Brookful steel body or even an original body may need a little rust repair or something like that. Um, but at the end of the day, in the grand scheme of things, you're not looking at that much more money to build yourself an original, you know, Henry Ford bodied car versus a fiberglass car. So it doesn't really make sense to me to go buy a, you know, replica body when 
you can go get a steel body and it's going to be worth double when you finish the car than what a um you know a replica 32 ford body would would bring so i'm not a big fan of it in 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 my industry um but i totally see where it it really comes in great benefit for for you guys especially what john was talking about why would you spend you know five million dollars to have a car when you can spend i don't know what a quarter of that to have a to have a replica and and display the exact same thing nobody's really getting close enough to them to realize it's not, but I'm sure y'all disclose that it is. You know, it is a replica, but this is what was used when the, you know, Ferraris were racing against the Lotuses at this point in time in history. So, um, totally, totally see that. Um, it, it doesn't change anything on, on, on that side of things other than, I mean, it, it, you know, somebody may think they're looking at a real one and not, but, I mean that that's you know that's that don't that don't mean nothing to me. So um, now now Will, I wanna I wanna throw something at you here because you talked about the fiberglass reproduction bodies yep. of you know uh, the and even the steel ones that are are coming out of some of the companies. But looking at like what John and I talked about, the actual replication of a historic vehicle i want to throw something at you that i see in the hot rod world and i I want to get your opinion on it because to me i mean i have my own opinions on it but what are your feelings on yeah the milner coupe okay from american graffiti you've got the milner coupe you know shown off in the the movie american graffiti and in my opinion, it's it's probably one of the most copied hot rods in history. Oh yeah, you see something that looks like a mil, you know, replication of the Milner Coupe at every almost every car cruise there is in this country. Yep. What do you think about that aspect of it? You know, not necessarily the fiberglass body that they might be using, but the fact that they're replicating one of the you know uh, legendary hot rods from American Graffiti. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. If if somebody came to to Big Oak Garage and wanted us to build a copy of a car that was famous, I would tell them we don't do that. Um, I'm not a fan of that. I get it. You really like that car. You really like that movie. Heck, let's build one like it. Um, to me, uh, I know this may piss people off, but this is just the way I feel about it. That's easy to do. Okay. It's easy to take something and copy it. It's a lot more difficult to be creative and come up with something that is original. Um, now, yes, you may take, for instance, you really like the way the fenders are cut on that car. Okay. Well, let's do something like that and change it up a little bit. You could take influences from that car, but don't recreate that car. Um, just, just not a big fan of it. Um, there's a lot of two lane black top 55s out there running around, uh, general Lee's. I mean, how many general Lee's are running around, yeah. you know, never been a fan of, of that type of thing. Um, you know, I, I like Kenny Wayne Shepard's general Lee recreation. Um, it's just, um, you know, it's not like the original general Lee, it's 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 got custom paint and it's just you know it's a little different um so something like that i can kind of understand it you really like that car but you put a little twist on it to make it your own um i understand it now if somebody brought me one of the cars from american graffiti and they wanted me to you know rebuild it just like the way it was uh, in the movie, I would have no problem in the world doing that. Um, to me, that would be really cool and something special to do. But just bringing me an old Model A body and wanting me to make it into the Milner Coupe, yeah, be hard. Be hard for me to do. 
I'm going to jump back a little bit onto the topic of, and I, I opened the door to, you know, our museum having replicas, and Derek alluded to the Henry Ford. And that's kind of common practice in a lot of museums and not just the automotive industry. Uh, a lot of uh, skeletons and fossils of dinosaurs and that in other museums are replicas or recreations. Uh, the museum might actually own the real pieces, but they a lot of times will display the replica just out of preservation stake, um, care of the artifacts and things like that. Because one of the things you do get, and that's what, you know, people will say, and I've I've had this happen at events where we've got a car on display and people come up and you go, it's real, and you, or is that real? And you say, no, it's a replica, and they go, oh, and then they don't care. But then a different replica they don't even ask about because it's something they haven't seen before. Um, you can't discount it. Like I said, it, it, it's an educational thing. I have always liked replicas and recreations and things like that as a way of, you know, being able to potentially enjoy something and allow the general public to enjoy it. I do understand, and the big negatives are the values. You know, how expensive and how valuable would a Cobra be if there weren't 10,000 replicas running around? Would a Lotus, a real Lotus 7 be a $100,000 car instead of a $30,000 car today if there weren't 88 different companies making replicas and a book on telling you how to build a replica for less than $750. Uh, you know, little things like that. And that's where they hurt is when it starts hurting the value. But if you're building a replica, you know, Ferrari 512 or 330 or something, I don't think that all the Norwood recreations and the uh, Carpentier re recreations out there are really affecting the value of Glickenhaus's P3, P4. You know, it's just one of those things that that car is going to be worth whatever it is now, $15 million. The fact that race car replicas does a really nice golf livery 917 that runs with an uh, LS motor, things like that, on a monocoque tub, probably a better and faster car than the originals. But I don't think that's, I don't think Jerry Seinfeld's losing sleep, sleep at night that his, um, what's his, I can't think of the guy's name, um, actor, famous guy, Steve McQueen, uh, driven 917 from the movie Le Mans is losing a little bit of value because there's those replicas out there. But because those replicas are out there, it's probably exciting a kid to now have the goal to go out and make enough money to have $20 million to try to buy Seinfeld's car when Seinfeld dies because Seinfeld ain't selling it while he's alive. So, you know, I think that they're, they're, I look at it as a, a way to encourage the hobby. You know, like we do say with this podcast, the idea is to expand the hobby and that's what these replicas and recreations do. Uh, Chuck Beck's been building these Beck 550s and 356s for years and has built hundreds of them. But 550s be, still continue to climb. Would they be $8 million cars instead of $6 million cars? I doubt it. I don't think the fact that Chuck Beck's building a VW base 2200cc uh, Volkswagen motored 550 replica is hurting the real Porsche uh, market. But that's, you know, the, again, those are as a supporter of these cars and a supporter of the hobby. And I'm not buying these cars for investments. I'll be honest, I'm not paying $5 million for cars. Even if I could, I don't know if I would. You know, I, I know somebody with with a real Cobra, but he also has, uh, you know, two Superformances to go along with it. Doesn't drive the real one, but drives a Superformance. And if somebody gets excited ab enough about his Superformance, he'll take you back to his warehouse and show you his real 64 Cobra. You know, so it, to me, it, it furthers the hobby and furthers the education. And that, that's what I look, you know, look at when it comes to cars. Uh, it's all about having fun. And that's what I think the, these vehicles allow. 
Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I'm going to go back to the beginning of the show where I said I was at the Historic Vehicle Association conference and actually gave a talk there that alluded to or that was related to our topic tonight. And I actually gave a, a talk on the sinkhole Corvettes here at the National Corvette Museum and talked a little bit about the decisions to uh, restore three of them and leave five of them as they came out of the hole. And one of the things I discussed with that, you know, we get a lot of questions at the museum. Well, why don't you just restore them all and make them look good again? Well, you know, it, it, can they can they be restored? I mean, yes, as most of us say in the hobby and in the industry, anything can be restored. It, how much money do you want to put into it? But in the case of the five that we have not restored, basically the point I was making in my talk was – they are so badly damaged frames engines suspension bodies interiors almost every part of those five cars that we're leaving as they came out of the hole have been damaged in some way and how many parts of a car during a restoration yeah, what percentage can you replace with new parts before it just becomes a replica? Why not just leave the ones that fell in the hole and are so badly damaged alone? And if it is really truly that important to have those cars in pristine condition again, build five replicas of those cars. Build the replicas of those cars and leave the ones that fell into the sinkhole alone. And it also goes back to the story of the cars, the history of the cars, and essentially what we would call the heritage of those cars, which is those five cars are destroyed essentially beyond repair due to something that happened, something significant that happened to them in their, their life as, as a Corvette. And we would almost erase the history of that if we just tried to restore those cars back using pretty much all new parts uh, to make them look as they did before they fell into the sinkhole. So I think that's another time when these replicas uh, can come into play, which is when something extremely significant, be it damage-wise or... Uh, you know, some other factor plays into it to where it's more important to leave the car as it is and then build the replica of it as it was as a whole car. And, and hopefully that makes sense and came out as clear as it did in my head while I was talking. I think that makes perfectly good sense. Um, to me, I enjoyed seeing those cars on the museum floor and i'm sure there's thousands of people that pay to walk through that door every year to see those smashed up corvettes you know and you know i i, I think you're right i mean if if it's so significant Go ahead, and they're going to be a, basically, like you said, a re, you know, a recreation of them anyway. Just if that's something that somebody really wants to do, we'll build a recreation of it. Go right ahead. That's what you're going to do with this car anyway. You're going to keep the VIN number. That's about it. So, I mean, I that's that would have been my decision to make. I mean, I would have made the same decision about that too. Now, Derek can tell me if I say too much, but. He he's been involved with those sinkhole. You've said too much. Those sinkhole Corvettes for a long time, even prior to his tenure at the uh, National Corvette Museum. And I want to say and you know thank him because I totally agree with what was done done with that in the preser preservation. And that is part of those cars' lives. And you know it's part of you know barn finds and oh this is this is all original and. This is the way it was. Well, guess what? 
Those cars are original. That's part of their life. If you do anything to them, you've altered their life. Yes, you know, then you can say, well, the restoration's part of their life and things. But in what Derek was saying, we have a, uh, a display that I'm very proud of it at our museum, and it's of a Lotus uh, Mark Mark 12. It's the first single seat uh, racer from Lotus, um, and you know, I want to say 1957. And what we have on display is an entire car running, driving, totally operable, and it's at the base of a three tiered rack, and directly above it is a frame, and directly above that is a body. Uh, you know, aluminum body. The aluminum body is the original body that car wore. The frame is the original frame that provided structure from that car in 1957. And people look at it and say, "Why don't you? Why didn't you just restore that frame? Why didn't you just restore that body? Why did you build another car? Because if you threw all the money in the world at it, that's what you would have had." We would have thrown the frame away because there's nothing left to salvage. There is not one straight tube on that frame. You know, there's nothing to even cut out and build everything else around. Every piece of that aluminum is torn or corroded or damaged in a way that it, to repair it would not serve justice. And you end up with what we have on display. So technically... We are, you know, we're displaying what could be considered a replica or a recreation, but in the vintage racing world, it is the original car because it carries the original VIN plate and there's a documented history. And the nice thing is we have the frame and we have the body from the original car, so there's not two of these ever going to show up. Same that goes back to the Surtees Ferraris we have. Is You know, at present, we own them both. Now, granted, if we ever did sell the replica or the real one, you could possibly expect in 20 years there would be an argument over which one's real and which one's not because how do you decide which one's real and which one's not? Well, and I think that's that's a, a key thing to talk about too is that when as museums and truthfully, I hope companies that are out there and even individuals that do this, but as museums, when we build replicas or recreations, yeah, we know that in a hundred years, we're not going to be around to tell people and, and do that. So we, we do document them very well that they're replicas. We do, you know, stamp them in some way, usually tagging them that this is a replica, this is not the original car, you know, because as time goes by, people forget things. People tend to tell stories that lead to confusion. Uh, and I think, John, you you might agree with me here. It happens a lot in the racing world. There are a lot of recreation and replica race cars out there that tend to get the stories muddled just enough that people question what the original car is, which is really a shame that that happens. And, you know, I think the other end of, of replica discussion or recreation discussion is the ethical end of it, where if you're going to do it, you're going to build it, you're, you're going to do, you know, a, a, replica uh, for fun for educational purposes whatever it be be honest and be truthful that it is a recreation or a replica and don't try to pawn it off as this is the real car and that's where we hope everybody stays honest and true and continues with that and i guess you get a little bit of the controversy a few minutes ago we had a technical issue and that's kind of why i stuttered through that ferrari conversation but at one point in time, we took the wheel, steering wheel off of the true, honest to goodness Ferrari 158 we have, the Surtees car, and moved it over to the replica and kind of joked with um, J John before he passed away that, oh, the other, the, here's the original because it's wearing the original steering wheel. And at what point, you know, what do you need? 
Um, years ago, I heard a story about Jaguar, I want to say D-types, it could have been a C-type, and that there were four Jaguar D, D or C-types, I really think it was a D-type, out there with the same VIN number or chassis number because nobody had determined what really made the car. Somebody bought one car, quartered it, and built four, you know, four other cars. And technically, he was right because the Jaguar Restorer Society or whoever controls Jaguar and that uh, hadn't determined what piece of a Jaguar meant it was a Jaguar. And they eventually determined it was one of the, I think it's a left front or the right front upright. And you have to have that piece because it has some sort of chassis identifier on it. You have to have that piece and that is the car. So you can't, you know, have four four of these all of a sudden all of them get cut up and 20 cars become 80 cars, all with legitimate numbers. But there's a lot of fraud that goes on with the race in the racing world because everybody needs to have a car that gets them into the right event. And a lot of those guys, that's why they're doing it, is they, and I've performed restorations for people that the only reason they're doing the restoration, they could care less about the car, is they want to go to the party. They want to go to the Saturday night dinner. They want to get ogled or you know, the the fanfare for winning whatever class they're in, and they go on. And it, it, it's a status quo. That's, you know, I'm probably offending some people, but to be honest, you're not the people we want, want listening to the podcast. Go away. We want people that enjoy enjoy their cars and are doing this for fun. It's okay to do the car to win a trophy, but have some damn passion about the car, too, and some honesty and some... Yeah, and you brought up some good points, and I think it, it gets a little off the replica recreation trail, and maybe it'll be a discussion for a, a different episode. But yeah, when people do start pulling cars apart and the engine goes over there, the body goes over there, and the chassis goes over there, uh, you know, now who has the original car? Because you know, the original engine's in that car over there, all the frame sits under that body, and the original body sits on that new frame over there and all three of the guys claim that they have the car well you know in in some of these cases as i think we've said it before before you know somebody needs to just buck up and and say hey look why don't we just get this thing back together um but i as i say it digressing down a, a path we don't need to go down tonight um but it is again kind of tied to that replica recreation discussion a little bit. And uh, I think as we've said on many shows before, and then as John just so well said, you know, this, this podcast is about having fun being involved in the hobby and from my uh, end of things. And I think, you know, Will said it before and John said it before, you know, if you're going to be in this, this is for fun. This is, you know, this is a hobby. This is, I mean, for some of it's a biz, for some of us, it's a living, but we try to have fun in it. And, and the big thing is we try to be honest and truthful in it and not, you know, muddy the story of history, but rather try to uh, define the story of these cars, histories and, and what they really are and, and they're important. Well said. I was going to say, I don't know if we, talked in circles and confused everybody but as i say that's, almost that's what i try to do every week. it confused me you know so um <laughs> it's i don't even i don't even know why i was here tonight you know <laughs> this was this was a little out of my element but <laughs> i enjoyed listening to it i guess i won't have to listen to it on monday right i'm gonna say that you you know how i feel when you guys get into these big discussions about work so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. You know, but I got to say, Will, I, I, your your discussion, especially on like the Milner Coop and, and some of that, it, it gives an interesting perspective from the hot rod world, in in my opinion, and, and your look at it. Yeah, you know, I mean, it'd be like somebody coming to you and, and saying, you know, I want to recreate. One of the, I'm trying to think of a famous hot rod. Give me a second here. I'm, well, let, I'm not a hot rod guy. <laughs> let, let me interject. I know, I think I know exactly what you're doing there, Derek. And, uh, and I, I've heard discussions from some of the people that were builders in the car 
But the car that won the Riddler this year was immediately, and a lot of the social media and a lot of the online dis- topics was, hey, that's Shazoom from 20 years ago. Now, yeah. the, um, again, I've said I listened to Brad Fanshaw, who used to be president of, you know, Coddington Enterprises and work with Boyd and was involved with Shazoom. He admits that that is Shazoom, but with no budget. They had a budget when they built Shazoom and they could never have done what they did. And his hat's off to that car. And he sees some of the styling cues, but he admits it's, you know, it's an original thing. But it would be just like me going up to Will and saying, hey, I got two million bucks. I like Cadzilla. Billy Gibbons isn't going to sell it to me. Build me Cadzilla. And yep. <laughs> is that the right thing to do? You know, Derek. I mean, I, yeah. Derek and I are talking about building replicas and recreations of cars. You know, some of the times they're one of ones, but you know, the five fifty, it's you know one of fifty or one of one hundred and fifty. I don't know how many five fifties they built offhand. But you know, for Will, it's building the car from American Graffiti, or building the car, you know, building Christine from whatever Stephen King novel, or again, build, building me Cadzilla, or building me the Eliminator. How many Eliminator replicas are out there now? Because all uh, of us are <laughs> is easy bunch. top fans. Um, a bunch. You know, he he has a lot more moral dilemma, and if all of a sudden his shop puts Big Oak Garage on. A Cadzilla re- re- recreation in that world, and correct me if I'm wrong, Will. It's probably going to be frowned upon because then all of a sudden it's going. To, they don't have, you know, they got talent. They can build a nice car, but they have no creativity, and that's not something you want to be labeled with. No, no, I, you know, if if somebody wants to build an iconic car, I mean, iconic cars just, you know, there's there's not that really that many in our industry, but if that's what you're wanting, build your own iconic car. Yes. I mean, we're talking millions of dollars here to do that, but if it means that much to you, build an original, you know, I mean, it's the same thing in the music industry. You know, people knock off other people's songs and yada, 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 yada. And, you know, it's, it's the same thing. Why do, why do you want to sing the same song as somebody else? You know, I get it when you're at a bar late at night and you're drinking and having fun. But if you're making a real career out of being playing music on the radio, how many times is a, a recreation of a song a hit? It's it's most of the time it's not. Um, you know, so it, it's all about originality and being creative and cool and different and building your own iconic car. So, I mean, that the, the green dart that we built, there was some pictures on Facebook the other day of a 65 dart painted the exact same color, the exact same stripes of that, of the dart that we built the green with the black and the orange black interior now, I know from a mile away it's nowhere near the same car because they didn't have the money to put to put into it. And, you know, on the flip side of that, when somebody tries to recreate one of your builds, to me, that's the ultimate form of flattery. Somebody like that car that you built so much, they want to build one like it. So, I mean... I, We've had that discussion about some of the uh, pickups I know that you, you've turned out of your shop and appear in a magazine, and all of a sudden, you know, I wonder where they got that idea. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, and like I said, a lot of people get pissed off about people copying them. You know, I, 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 I think it's cool. You know, I think that's somebody like what you created so much, they want one for their self. But... You know, yeah, there's a lot of little details here and there that um, that went into the original that, you know, they didn't. Or somebody takes an idea that that you 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 incorporated on one of your builds and it goes to something that's even better than the one you did, you know. And uh, and, and ultimately, that's kind of how the world has evolved, <laughs> you know. Um, somebody takes somebody's idea that they did and pushes the envelope a little bit farther and um 
you know, next thing you know, it's it's just out of control. So, I mean, I, I get recreations, but uh, that's really not something that we do at Big Oak Garage. I'm going to say with that, as I kind of do every week, we've had hit or we've encroached on that 60-minute mark again. We don't want to bar- bore you guys too much. I think we got kind of Will's final statements there. I could be wrong. He, he never seems to run out of words. Or, Derek, do you have anything in conclusion? I think, we, you know, I think we've had a pretty good topic or discussion on this and politically correct fashion. We haven't really stated <laughs> whether you're right or wrong if you're doing one of these things. But we've, I think we've provided a lot of food for thought on, on the topic, and hopefully some listeners might get back to us and interject what they think and uh, tell us if we're right or wrong. Or As always, we're probably wrong. No, no, no. Um, no, I think, I think it's been an interesting conversation. I think we've probably pointed out a few things, which is – you know, for educational purposes, for preservation purposes, replicas and recreations are a great thing. And in in a world of creativity and and artistry, such as the hot rod world, as as Will talks about, you know, doing a replica of a, a car that already exists, a hot rod that already exists, there's that's not hot rodding because it's not creative. It's just uh, taking someone else's idea and copying it. And you know, if you're going to be a true hot rodder, a true uh, modifier of an automobile, there's an art to that. And you should use your creativity to create that. So I think it's a interesting look at two different worlds. And, and the reason John brought us all together was to look at the different worlds we all live in. And I think this show kind of shows exactly that where, uh, you know, some of us, you know, we see the value in certain replicas and uh, we see the, the little value that replicas have in something like the hot rod world. So. Leave your Fieros a Fiero. That's my closing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to add something else. You know, nobody's really wrong and nobody's really right. If 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 your heart is set on a John Milner coupe, build that John Milner coupe. If your heart set on creating your own one-off piece, create your own one-off piece. That's what makes this hobby so freaking great. Is if that's what you want, build it. It don't matter if somebody likes it or if they don't like it. Who cares? As long as you like it, you like putting your butt behind that steering wheel and going and enjoying that car, however you want to, that's what it's all about. And, you know, I don't dislike somebody because they built the John Milner coupe or a replica of the McMullen roadster. You know, I'm probably going to look at it, but it's just not something that I would do myself or do at my shop. So, if if that's if that's what you want to do, do it. And if you think it's cool, that's all that matters. I'm done. I like that. As the old Al said, you know, be yourself. I'm out of here for the night, guys. Uh, we'll talk to you in a week. Ten foe. See you guys later.